Namaste friends, welcome to another episode on the Bhagavad Gita. Just as every week, I'm going to start this week also with a song. And I'm going to sing for you a traditional Bengali song today that was written by Rabindranath Tagore, who Master speaks highly of in the autobiography of a yogi. And this song, I'll tell you later on in the episode why I picked this song for today, because there's a line in there which prompted me to choose this one. And this song was actually translated by Master into English. It is very well known as a chant written by Master and the chant is Thou art my life, thou art my love. It's a beautiful chant and uh, if you pay close attention to the song that I'm singing in Bengali, you will hear that Master not only adapted and translated the words into English, he also adapted the melody. The Indian melody is a little more intricate and Master simplified it for the Western year so everyone can easily sing the song. So, uh, I'll... Uh, first present the song for you before we discuss the Gita verse for today. Shata Mangala Premo Moya Tumi Dhruva Jyoti Tumi Ondhokare Shata Mangala Premo Moya Tumi Dhruva Jyoti Tumi Ondhokare Tumi Shada Jor Hrde Biraje Tumi Shada Jor Hrde Biraje Dukha Jala Shai Pashure Shabha Dukha Jala Shai Pashure Shata Mangala Premo Moya Tumi Dhruva Jyoti Tumi Ondhokare Tomaro Gyane Tomaro Dhyane Tabo Name Kotho Madhuri Tomaro Gyane Tomaro Dhyane Tabo Name Kotho Madhuri Je Bhokato Shre Jane Je Bhokato Shre Jane Tumi Jano Jare Shre Jane Shata Mangala Premo Moya Tumi Dhruva Jyoti Tumi Ondhokare Shata Mangala Premo Moya Tumi Dhruva Jyoti Tumi Ondhokare Thou art my life, thou art my love. Thou art the sweetness which I do seek. In the thought by my love brought, I taste thy name so sweet. Devotee knows how sweet you are. He knows whom you let know. Let's meditate briefly now. Today, after spending many weeks on the sixth chapter, we are finally moving on to the sec uh, seventh chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. And uh, this chapter of the Gita is called Jnana Vijnana Yoga. Often it is translated as knowledge and discernment or knowledge and discrimination. And um, I was uh, mentioning many times as I was discussing verses from the sixth chapter that the sixth chapter has a lot of practical advice. It is a chapter on meditation where uh, Krishna is actually instructing Arjuna on how to practice the science of meditation. This chapter uh, is rather esoteric. There are a lot of metaphysical concepts that Krishna uh, reviews with Arjuna in this chapter. and. Uh, uh, all I can say is I've been blown away by reading Swami Kriyananda's commentary. I don't think he writes like this in any other book of his. And uh, I will try to do my best to share small nuggets of wisdom from Swami Kriyananda's commentary because it is 
far too vast for me to cover in its entirety or even to do justice to every idea that he's presenting in these verses. Uh, the verses that I picked for today are actually two verses, uh, verses four and five of the seventh chapter. And uh, again, like I said, these are very esoteric and uh, complex verses, uh, for lack of a better word. And the commentary on these verses that Swami Kriyananda writes goes, for, goes on for pages. So we'll uh, see how much we can cover today. And I certainly want to touch upon some core ideas that Krishna is presenting. As I always do, I'm going to first read the two verses in Sanskrit and I'm going to give you the translation of the verses. And after that, I'll uh, share some brief commentary on the meaning. We'll first start with the fourth verse of seventh chapter. Bhumi rapo anulo vayihu kham mano buddhi revacha aham kara itiyam me bhinna prakriti rashtada. And uh, I'll first read the English translation of this verse, the fourth verse of seventh chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. Earth, water, fire, air, ether, the perceiving mind, discernment, and causative self-awareness are the eightfold divisions of my manifested nature. So that is the fourth verse of seventh chapter, and now I will read the fifth verse. Apareya mitastvanyam prakritim vidhim me param. Jiva Bhuta Mahabaho Yayedam Dharyate Jagat. And this verse, this is how Swami Krenanda literally translates this verse. Such is my lower nature or apara prakriti. Understand now, O mighty armed Arjuna, that my other higher nature or para prakriti sustains the soul which is individual consciousness and sustains also the life principle of this universe. So, I don't know how much you can make out from those verses. I couldn't do much until I read Swami Kriyananda's commentary, which is what I want to share briefly today. Now, the two verses present to us this idea of the two aspects of nature or uh, the nature of creation itself. Prakriti is a Sanskrit word that Krishna uses, that Gita presents to us in these verses. And Prakriti simply means nature. By nature, we are not just talking about the natural world, but we are talking about the nature of creation itself. And Krishna here differentiates between two aspects of Prakriti, and he calls them Apara Prakriti and Para Prakriti. And uh, in the first verse, he gives the eight aspect of what he calls as manifested nature and then he goes on to say this is apara prakriti or the lower aspect of my manifestation and then he says there is the higher aspect of my manifestation which is the para prakriti which is truly that which sustains all living creatures that which sustains consciousness and that is the sustaining life principle of this entire universe now we'll first review the eight aspects of manifested nature that Krishna is presenting in the fourth uh, verse of the seventh chapter. And here are the eight attributes that he uh, describes or lists here. The eight attributes are earth, water, fire, air, ether, uh, the perceiving mind, uh, the intellect or the discerning faculty, and um, the self-awareness, the ego-identified self-awareness. I want to get all the words of uh, that Swami uses exactly because there's a lot of subtlety in some of these ideas that are being presented in these verses. He calls it causative self-awareness. That's how Swami puts it. Now, um, these two verses often, as I always say in these Gita commentaries, I'm astonished at how sometimes they're uh, literally translated in a way that's not all that helpful and not accurate in terms of what Krishna is trying to communicate to us. Uh, obviously, if you have been following these uh, interpretations given by Paramhansa Yogananda, especially in the first few episodes of the series, I went through uh, the symbolism in the Mahabharata, and we come back to that in this verse as well, as Krishna is describing the five elements, earth, water, fire, air, and ether. Now, oftentimes, translations 
um, translate this particular aspect or these five attributes described by Krishna as referring to the natural world? Well, in a sense they do, but they're actually talking about the inner world as well, that part of us that is being pulled out. And what are these five elements referring to, if you haven't guessed it yet? They refer to the five lower chakras. And that's where I was talking about the symbolism in the Bhagavad Gita and the Mahabharata, which we reviewed earlier on in the series, because these five elements are actually symbolically represented by the five Pandava brothers, each one of them representing the upward flow of energies in the five lower chakras. So Krishna starts by describing the manifested nature of his creation with these first aspects, with these five aspects first, the five lower chakras into which creation has descended. And then he goes on to add three more attributes to, the, to this list. And what are those three? They are uh, perceiving mind or manas, discernment or buddhi or the intellect, and then the causative self-awareness or ahankara. And these three aspects of consciousness, we have again discussed this as well in another verse of the Gita right now. I don't remember which chapter or which verse we covered this in. But in the autobiography of a yogi, Yoganandaji offers a much more detailed description of these aspects of consciousness. Yoganandaji talks about four aspects of consciousness. And the four of them are manas or the perceiving mind, buddhi or the intellect, uh, the causate of self-awareness or what we often call ego identity, that is ahankara. And the fourth aspect or one might say it is the very first aspect is what we call chitta. And chitta is the essential feeling nature of consciousness itself. Interestingly enough, Krishna lists all eight of these attributes but skips one of them. And the aspect that he skips is chitta or the pure feeling nature of consciousness. And Swami Kriyananda addresses that in the commentary and that's because right after the seventh verse, uh, sorry, right after the fourth verse where he uh, lists these eight attributes, Krishna goes on to say, but these are aspects of my lower nature. Um, you know, para and apara, these are the Sanskrit words that Krishna uses, para prakriti and apara prakriti. Para simply means supreme or absolute. And apara means that which is not. You can uh, probably guess that even without knowing Sanskrit, it is simply the opposite of para, that which is not absolute, that which is not supreme. And Krishna says, these eight attributes of my creation, of my manifested universe, are those aspects which are not absolute. And what is absolute? We'll come to that in a bit. But the reason why chitta is not listed as one of the attributes uh, in this particular verse is because chitta is in fact a reflection of para prakriti, that uh, essential nature of our consciousness, that feeling nature is pure bliss. That is why we say Satchit Ananda. Satchit Ananda is how we describe God Himself, that pure consciousness that is absolute. So, Chitta, in its purest essence, is experienced as para prakriti. Of course, when it is tainted by these eight aspects, when it is tainted by the perceiving mind, by the discerning intellect, and the causative self-awareness, then it is embroiled in emotions and that pure feeling nature can be experienced in its lower octaves as well. But in its truest essence, chitta is absolute consciousness and pure bliss. And that is why Krishna does not list it as one of the eight attributes of this manifested nature that is lower. And then now we come to the fifth verse of the seventh chapter where Krishna is talking about para prakriti. And again, I'm going to read this verse again. It almost takes me a few <laughs> times to read even the literal translation of the verse to get all the words in our mind and, um, you know, the ideas that Swami is presenting here. O mighty armed Arjuna, understand this to be my higher nature, uh, para prakriti, that sustains the soul, which is individual consciousness, and also sustains the life principle of this universe. Before I even explain uh, this uh, idea of para prakriti or what Krishna is talking about here, I thought I'll read a story for you from New Path, which is Swami Kriyananda's autobiography. It's not a story as much as just a conversation between uh, Yogananda and Swami Kriyananda because yesterday as I was meditating on this verse, I realized this particular incident that Swami describes in the New Path perfectly summarizes the idea 
that is being presented in these two verses. And I'm going to read it exactly as Swami writes it in the New Path. I thought I'll share the story then. Why not just read it from the book when I can do that? Um, this is from chapter 29 of the New Path that is called 29 Palms. <laughs> is that right? I'm not sure which number it is. Uh, I think the chapter is called 29 Palms. And this is how uh, Swami Kriyananda writes it. Late one afternoon, we were sitting with Master on a little porch outside the sitting room where he dictated his writings. After several minutes of silence, Master posed me an unexpected question. What keeps the earth what keeps the earth from shooting out into the space away from the sun? Surprised and not yet as familiar with the cryptic way he often taught us, I assumed he simply wanted a lesson in astronomy, and I said, It's sun's gravitational pull, sir. Then what keeps the earth from being drawn back into the sun? That's the earth's centrifugal force pulling it constantly outward. If sun's gravity weren't as strong as it is, we would shoot off into space, out of the solar system altogether. Master smiled significantly. Had he intended more than I realized? Some months later, I recalled this conversation and understood that he has been speaking metaphorically of God as the sun, drawing all things back to himself and of man as the earth resisting with desires and self-interest the pull of divine love. Now that's such a beautiful story, it's such a beautiful image to even think about why the earth is constantly held in its orbit, neither does it crash into the sun nor does it catapult into the space. Because there are these two forces in balance, the centrifugal force that is constantly keeping the earth in its orbit and the gravitational pull of the sun that is constantly drawing the earth back, that's constantly making the earth go round and round, uh, the sun instead of being pulled into space. And that's really what Krishna is describing in these verses. It is exactly what para-prakriti and apara-prakriti mean. Para-prakriti is the gravitational pull of the sun. It is the pull of the God. It is the uh, manifested creation that is inside us, the flow of energy in our spine, which is always drawing us inside, even if not in meditation practice, even if one is not consciously, spiritually seeking it. It is drawing us inside as that experience of bliss that we are constantly in pursuit of. And apara prakriti, on the other hand, is that centrifugal force. It is that individual ego, the causative self-awareness that is constantly drawing us out through the senses, through the vrittis in the chakra, the five elements manifested within us and draws us into the outer world, into the world of senses to seek that fulfillment outside. And both these forces are important because they sustain creation. And Krishna is telling Arjuna, this force, the centrifugal force, uh, if I may call it so, the apara prakriti, is the lower aspect of my nature. And that is manifested as these eight attributes that I'm listing here. And this force is constantly pulling you outside. And remember, these all are, uh, these all are parts of Krishna's creation. These are all parts of God's creation and part of the manifested universe. But the purpose of uh, their existence is to draw us outside. And there is the other force, the para prakriti, which is the force within, is the gravitational pull of divine love that is constantly drawing us inside. And this creation itself is a balance between these two. Now I want to read some of Swami Kriyananda's own words in this commentary because I'm not sure if I can do justice in paraphrasing them. The Supreme Spirit, in manifesting the universe, set forth a portion of its consciousness vibrating to produce his aspect of Divine Mother or Paraprakriti, the pure aspect of cosmic vibration. In the outward manifestations, that aspect becomes simply Prakriti or Aparaprakriti, the outer show that we see through the senses, the trees, hills, people, whole star systems around us, People who try to commune with nature in beautiful sunsets, colorful clouds, and soaring mountains cannot enter the true communion with the divine, even though these things do remind one of God. True communion with nature, however, can be done inwardly through communion with the Om vibration. So, 
what we are referring to as para prakriti in these verses, that absolute pull of the divine that is drawing us back to the God, is in fact the Om vibration. Because as much as all of this world around us, these eight aspects of consciousness that are drawing us outward and all the sense perceptions and all the experiences that the external world offer to us, as much as they may be God reminding, they cannot draw us back inward. And what draws us back inward is that same experience that we have inside. It is that experience of that Om vibration which can be perceived in deep meditation. Those of uh, you who might be practicing teachings of self-realization or of Yogananda or the path of Kriya Yoga know of this technique called Om technique. It is a way of uh, practicing a certain mudra and a certain form of meditation in order to tune into the inner sounds that one can hear when the sense of hearing is turned inward and those sounds are the reflection of the Om vibration. Now if you are not familiar with what I am talking about, certainly you can reach out to me or any Ananda centers that is near you or online and um, you know somebody can help you with what uh, this particular technique is that I am referring to. What Krishna is talking about here is that this Om vibration, these subtle sounds, these experiences that are there inside of us, that is the gravitational pull. The more we are able to tune into them, we are tuning into the higher nature of Krishna's manifested creation, that will draw us back in. And that is where we come to the fifth verse of the seventh chapter where Krishna says, My other higher nature or paraprakriti sustains the soul which is individual consciousness and sustains also the life principle of the universe. This Om vibration, this paraprakriti or the supreme nature of Krishna's manifested universe is what sustains all of creation. It looks like the world is self-sustained. It looks like the material universe is all that there is. And yet Krishna is revealing to Arjuna that is not so. What is underneath all of this material manifestation, what is behind these eight attributes of consciousness which is drawing us out, is actually the Om vibration, the cosmic vibration that first came from Spirit, that manifestation of Divine Mother that is constantly vibrating. And when we are able to tune into that in meditation, as we are able to turn those senses inward, as we have been studying in all these verses of the Gita, we are able to draw that energy back in. Um, Swami Kriyananda talks about a lot of subtle ideas in these verses of how when we are manifested in the physical universe, our own awareness is encased in the ego. He talks about how we completely identify externally. In the causal realm, he says, we are much, much closer to the Christ consciousness and we never lose awareness of our connection with that infinite uh, divine source. And in the astral plane or the energy plane, um, we are externally defined, but we are more defined by what we feel, what we are in our own flows of energy. Whereas when we descend onto the material plane, when we are completely identified with these eight attributes, which all of us are to some extent because we are embodied beings, as that is how Krishna refers to all of us in one of the other verses of the Gita, in that particular state of existence, we are completely defined externally. And the more we tune in to this para prakriti, the more we are able to draw in through this own vibration, we are able to draw ourselves back into that state of knowing our true identity. Now, uh, one interesting uh, or rather, rather notable point that uh, one observes when reading the seventh chapter as I was reading all these pages of commentary written by Swami Kriyananda is how impersonal Krishna is in describing all of this because there's a lot that Swami Kriyananda talks about especially in the commentary on these two verses about the nature of Maya and Satan because I'm talking about Apara Prakriti as nature and beautiful sunset and uh, you know all the other aspects of this external world and our own mind that draws away from that inner awareness but we are also talking about all the satanic poles that make us suffer in delusion. And I'll read a few more lines from Swami Kriyananda's commentary on the fifth verse. The inward pull of para prakriti or the mighty sound of Om is ever available to the soul. However, if one insists on looking outward for his satisfactions, he will succumb 
to the outward pull of apara prakriti. What Krishna is referring to through this apara prakriti is also Satan or Maya. Maya is a rather impersonal word as you can see already in the Indian tradition. The word Satan, when I even say that uh, because of its connotations in the West, it just has this strong negative vibe to it. This is not negative or positive. Krishna is simply stating things as they are. These are just aspects of creation. Just as that conversation between Yoganandaji and Swami Kriyananda about just the objective nature of the universe, the centrifugal force, the individual nature of the earth that keeps the earth from collapsing back into the sun and the gravitational pull of the sun that keeps the earth rotating. And these are the two forces. And Maya or Apara Prakriti is that centrifugal force that is constantly pulling us away. If one insists on looking for outward satisfaction, however, he will succumb to the outward pull of apara prakriti, which is ever at the disposal of those who they laugh at the temptations of the devil, think it is merely fun to drink, perfectly normal to lose their temper and shout angrily on an occasion, so far from, from it seeing wrong as to be virtually expected of them, to seek endless sexual enjoyment. So all these Swami Kriyananda is describing as pulls of that apara prakriti, as that centrifugal force that is drawing us out. And as he also says in that commentary, the pull of para prakriti, of that own vibration that we can listen to, that we can tune into at any time, is also always available with us. In fact, it is a lot more available than all these external pulls. These external pulls, um, their remnant it resides in us only as fag. Um, figments of the mind because we dwell on the sense ideas whereas the para prakriti the own vibration that is always at the center it does not shift it does not change it is not like the fleeting impression of thoughts in our mind that come back go that go back and forth that is there this moment and not there the pull of para prakriti which is the center inside our own spine is always available for us i want to come back to the song that i shared at the beginning of the episode i don't want to leave that thread hanging uh, as I was meditating, the particular line came to me talking about this particular verse and the story I shared from the new path. The lines from that song, Devotee knows how sweet you are, he knows whom you let know. I find those lines so touching. It talks about the grace of the God and the grace of the Guru. And I was thinking about how this own vibration is that grace. It is always there with us and it is letting us know how sweet our Creator is, how sweet God and Guru are, and how they are always waiting to receive us if we would only tune back inside. So with that, I'll end this episode and I'll see you next week with another verse from the seventh chapter of the Gita. Until then, God bless you all.